All right, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out. I'm Annie Pepitone. I'm the current co-chair of Simmons Asist. And uh, I want to introduce these two lovely people, Rob and Pete. And <laughs> do you prefer Jeff or Jeffrey? Jeff. Jeff Pomerantz. And I said that right. Oh, yeah. Yes. OK. <laughs> well, for those of you that don't know Rob and Pete, she is a full-time Gisla's faculty member. She's been an early advocate of open access. Um, and in scholarly communication, has written more than 200 articles. Is that about right? Mm -hmm. On digital and scholarly publishing. Um, she serves as the co-founder of the Open Access Directory. <laughs> and in addition, she serves as associate editor for book reviews. I do work, seriously. Oh, not anymore? I haven't been on that for years. <laughs> and your bio is outdated. <laughs> I'm the editor of the Open Access Directory. Okay, so we'll keep it at that. Um, she's had experience in publishing, computer services, and academic libraries. Her current research is focused on the history and evolution, still, right? Okay, of the OA movement and the development of OA mandates, journals, and institutional change. <clears throat> and then Jeff here is an associate professor and the director of undergraduate students in the School of Information and Library Science at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Okay. Uh, he earned his PhD from the School of Information Studies at Syracuse and his MS list at Simmons. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> it made me the man I am. <laughs> Research focuses on human mediated information services, right? Uh, digital libraries and the evolution of information services. So please join me in welcoming both Jeff and Robin. Whenever I, I talk about the Digital Public Library Project of America, I always have to start with the way John Palfrey introduced it um, and uses it almost every time he talks about it. Uh, in an introduction, and that is, is taller than I am, but he raises his arm and says, we have an opportunity here to do something like this. And I really like that. You know, and when we, we were first working with the notion of the Digital Public Library of America, you know, this idea of creating um, a Digital Public Library of America, uh, the first thing you have to say, we're going to do something like here, we're going to, you know, that's what we're going to strive for. And then, uh, you know, not something mediocre, not something average, <laughs> but we're going to try to do something that's really magnificent. So the Digital Public Library of America uh, launches um, tonight, uh, officially. Uh, and I actually, let, on the note of do something magnificent, I think it was not an accident that they launch it in Boston. Um, one of the two places in the United States that lays claim to having the first public library. Um, the other one is, what is it, Hanover, New Hampshire, yeah. or something like that, but we're really good, of course. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, the fact that they called it the Digital Public Library of America is not an accident. I mean, it really, there is in the United States a public library a approach to public librarianship that really sort of has some cultural resonance and to frame this project that way. They didn't have to frame it that way. They couldn't, they could have called it something different. They could have just called it the Digital Library of America or something. But they put public in there and I think that was a very deliberate play on this approach to public librarianship. Um, and I suspect that was all Paul Free. Uh, Anyway, it's appropriate that it's in Boston that is where the launch is happening. Uh, very, very much so. Um, Jeff and I, by the way, work together a lot, so if we finish each other's sentences, you know, we're used to it. And for a long time. <laughs> for a long time. Um, so the Digital Public Library of America's uh, aspirations follow um, in, in what is now the early tradition of Urpania, uh, which is the European public library system, the structure is, is somewhat different than uh, the way the Upania is set up. Uh, it's based on a content hub model. And at the, this point, 
the primary material you'll see at the DPLA sites are materials that, that fall into the public domain. Um, so we're talking about the National Archives and Records Administration, we're talking about the Smithsonian, we're talking about Harvard's uh, special collections, we're talking about a whole bunch of different content hubs that are already existing and they're already part of the, you know, the DPLA start. So this isn't theoretical. Uh, but I would say the, you know, the DPLA discussion started um, a couple of years ago. And there's funding behind it. Uh, I don't know how well you can make this out, not at all, really. Um, they used, Maybe lower some more. Yeah, um, yeah, they used, uh, I, I'm embarrassed to admit, Carolina Blue, which means that it's illegible on the screen. Uh, this is something we've learned at UNC. Uh, by the way, Duke Blue reads much better, but we don't like to admit that. Uh, this is a list of the partner institutions um, at the DPLA and the number of records that they have contributed, which are Dark. <laughs> it's one or all. It That's looks right. like. At any rate, um, if you go to the DPLA's website, which is dp.la, um, there's a link. You can get to this fairly easily. But there are a bunch of both public and academic libraries that are partner institutions um, of the DPLA. Some consortia, like the Mountain West Digital Library, which is what Utah and Colorado and Arizona. Uh, some universities, like Harvard, of course, University of Southern California and whatnot, and my understanding is that they're always on the lookout for additional partner institutions. The idea, like Europeana, of course, is to aggregate the cultural heritage of the United States writ large. I mean, the, the goal of Europeana is nothing short of a portal to the cultural heritage of Europe. And how many cultural heritage institutions are there in Europe? I mean, there must be thousands, right? Mm -hmm. um, there are a larger number of partner institutions of Europeana, but it's three or four years older than the DPLA. The DPLA is similarly trying to aggregate cultural heritage materials from across the entire United States. So I suspect in a year we'll see twice this many partner institutions. Uh, so What's happening look, tomorrow is DPLA Fest. And the DPLA Fest is where uh, Jeff, myself, and Amanda Page, uh, who was in the inaugural class of the Open Access course, um, as well as Sandra McInerney, will be uh, doing a workshop event uh, on Open Access and the DPLA. Yes, this is our. Um that's the title of our session in the description. Uh, we have a third, uh, Sandra McIntyre, who is the what, program director, I believe, at the Mountain West Digital Library Consortium. Uh, so coming at this issue from the perspective of a content provider, uh, rather than coming at it from the perspective of open access, or in my case, coming at it from the perspective of building digital libraries. So it's an interesting triumvirate here. Yeah, it, and so open access, um, Jeff and I have been having a lot of discussion about it. When we're talking about the DPLA and we talk about open access, first thing you have a split of information that's in the public domain, which can be re reused without any permissions. And then you have the content that's being created as we speak. So the open access part of this question is how can we take materials that are being created now, um, born digitally, and make them um, and craft them in such a way that they fit into this model um, and move ahead in, to the DPLA's future. Uh, so yeah. these are the, the, what the DPLA Fest organizers are calling the driving questions yes. of our session. Right. How can records, now bear in mind that the DPLA is essentially a metadata repository. They do not host content. They are a metadata repository where the records point back to the actual digital content which is hosted by their partner institutions. Right. So they're talking about records, but um, I want to I knock over the podium. Uh, I want to... Uh, 
show you this, which is um, the DPLA already has some policies in place that says the metadata that we have aggregated is being made available under a Creative Commons Zero license, which means we dedicate it to the public domain. So the DPLA has already embraced the notion of open access, at least for the metadata. Right. And now, of course, we're starting to talk about, well, how can we push on that a bit and get the partner institutions to open up the content that this stuff points to, that these metadata records point to. So this is a harder case, of course, because we're talking about multiple institutions buying into uh, a, a, a much more open model than where they are presently. And in the same way with the open access community, is bridging the open access community with the activities of the DPLA, uh, which is really a new um, way of looking at the, D the DPLA. So our, part of our workshop um, events tomorrow <coughs> would be how we can extend this discussion uh, to the communities that haven't been part of the original content hubs that are, are in existence where there's more uh, traditional understanding of you know, things like metadata and you know, interoperability and so forth. Where we, you know, we were just, just talking about this this, uh, this morning, uh, uh, like open educational resources. Um, how are they going to fit into the DPLA? Because when you use the word public, you're in a different world than just saying, you know, this is um, scholarly communication. Right. It's not the Digital Academic Library of America. Could have been. Right. But, but, but <laughs> I think that was, a, that was a really deliberate decision on their part. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there has to be a, a more global global view on the content of what people are expecting. So when we talk about open educational resources or that way of open access, we're talking about materials that extend from the states, um, Material. Right, and the DPLA has done some really interesting things. Whoops, uh, done some really interesting things already, just with the metadata records that they have that are open. They've you know created created maps of uh, that you can zoom in, of course, and these bubbles will burst apart as you zoom down um, to say, well, these are where these holdings live, or these are places that have been photographed that are you know, where in the holdings of a library across the country. So just with open metadata records, they've already started building interesting tools. So I think the, the hook here is going to have to be, well, if you had more open than that, if you had actual content, what kind of interesting things could be built on top of this large aggregation? More open data means more interesting development that can be done building on that. The question is, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. And how do we uh, engage population where the, the knowledge that we have within the field itself and in, in the library and information science field is not as well extended? So in the uh, area of open access, we have people who are running open access journals who are scholars and researchers in biomedical medical sciences. You know, and if you want to really lose somebody in, at the table, uh, you can start getting too over the top and talking about, uh, oh, and it did. So, well, yeah. You know, yeah, and there's this, this um, so when we talk about open access, we're talking about open culture free culture activities. And there's a, there's actually a long tradition of this, and many people think that open access was discussed before we even used the term. The open access term itself is 10 years old. Uh, but we, prior to that, we were calling it all sorts of other things. It was only we galvanized around the open access. But open source, for example, um, and I, I would say that for, for those of you following along at home, watching the video, all of these are links and you can get to this presentation. So if you're interested in, in exploring these more, these links will bring you to resources. 
So uh, there is an et cetera behind this, but we have the open educational resources, which could be what are being created by school systems, but it can also include many materials being used by homeschoolers. Open data, of course, a lot of this is coming out of uh, data.gov, the umbrella with federal agencies, but also you know, scientific research projects, making the data sets behind projects open, in addition to just publications that build on that data, so that those data sets can be used for secondary data analysis or you know, replication, et cetera. Um, then, of course, you have open government, which is a whole other thing, uh, related to open data, of course, but the data sets that come out of government operations and transparency, which, of course, is a very different kind of movement, but relates to openness. And I'm not even sure what term to use. This is part of the problem. Is it free culture? Is it openness? Is, you know, what, how do you talk about open writ large? And particularly when the language that we use in open access has traditionally been around scholarly communication, where we talk about gold journals and green repositories um, and sort of its own, its, its own evolved language uh, that doesn't apply to some of these other open uh, areas. But these other groups are coming on really strong. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the Open Knowledge Project has a definition of open that's, I think, pretty reasonable, um, but certainly not the only one out there. And it's this, mm -hmm. right? Free to use, reuse, and redistribute. You know, which is very much seems to be taking off on the Creative Commons uh, model of their licenses, which it deal with what uh, reuse, attribution, and sharing. And also commercial, you know, and commercial, commercial reuse. Commercial, yeah. and commercial reuse. So there's you know, Creative Commons uh, as an organization and as a, as a model pretty much was with open access all the time because we needed to have a modeling system uh, in play to, to be able to, describe, to work with this material. Um, for those of you in the open access course, you're going to get such a heavy dose of intellectual property that's coming. <laughs> um,